from China, from Shanghai, and uh, I'm a PhD student of the Edley uh, program, uh, uh, European doctor, Doctorate of uh, uh, Law and Economics. Yeah. Come to the table. Uh, I'm Baital Ahmed from, uh, uh, I'm working here as administrative assistant and in the Nova Center. Yeah. I'm Michal, uh, research coordinator of the center. Medav, postdoctoral research uh, fellow here. Maya Mark, uh, postdoctoral fellow here. Deborah Shmueli, one of the PIs of Minerva. I'm Deb Housen Coyal. Please call me Deb, and I'm at your mercies today. She's so. going to give us a fascinating presentation. We'll see. We'll see. No. Okay. Um, so, Ido, last time we did this, uh, um, well, say who I am. So, I'm also a researcher here at Minerva. Um, this is a, kind of a symbolic meeting for me because um, I've been started out. With a research grant from I think almost four years ago, right, Micha? Mm -hmm. When you and I first talked. So um, uh, we're not quite and uh, under Ido and Amnon uh, and Amnon's uh, supervision. We're not quite done, but this is really a milestone in terms of presenting um, kind of the structure of everything that we've uh, researched and. Um, We'll focus in, the case study will be one of the particular researchers, but I'll start by giving kind of an overview of what we did uh, as the general, for the general research project, say who the we is, and then dive into the digital property issue. Um, and for which f that, I also have kind of an introductory comment. Um, the digital property paper, I'm not, I don't know if anybody got to read it. I usually don't get to read things ahead of time because who has time? Um, but uh, when we get to the, the part of the presentation about digital property, um, please remember this is uh, my, my field of specialty is cybersecurity law. Um, and this digital property thing was kind of a new, uh, a very new uh, enterprise for me. So it's, it's really, I really got into it because of curiosity. Um, and you'll be able to shoot down possibly a lot of the ideas and initiatives. But uh, I, I think we're ready to go with publication, but you'll let me know if, if we're not, obviously. Um, and you know, last time we did this thing with a on air, it didn't work. So should we check something? The audio wasn't that good, as you can see. We improved the okay. audio. Now. Okay. So. Um, so can everybody see the slides, or is there glare? It's a, it's a problem because in order for it to be on YouTube, and I know there are people who want to see this, we have to keep at least one light on. Okay. Okay. That's better. Can you take another one off, or it won't work? <laughs> It'll no, be into it. Is, well, let's try. Yeah, we can manage. No, we can manage. Really? Sure. Yeah. Okay. okay, and you try want me? To take the second one off as well. And you know, if I'm not looking yeah. the right, we can try. Yeah. If I'm not looking the right way, then you'll let me know. I'm going to be mostly there. So I thought I'd take about thirty-five minutes. Hi. Uh, I thought I'd take about thirty-five minutes to. Uh, go through the presentation, feel absolutely free to interrupt, ask questions, etc. Um, this is our title, Cybersecurity Regulation, a case study, which is possibly the most vague title anybody could possibly could, could think of. Um, yeah. Um, the topic that we're going to look at in depth today is uh, digital property and what happens to uh, digital property when countries start to regulate it. Um, but there's a framework, and this is the framework, uh, the, this is the poster that uh, you made. Yes, um, we made. And this it's is the outside. we. Oh, wait, it's outside? Of course. You okay, have to look. so the overall, I was rushing in, but okay. the overall uh, framework for the research that uh, we did here, um, and which Ido guided um, closely, is called Cybersecurity Emergency Preparedness through regulation and a, co a comparative approach. We looked at, uh, tw as you'll see, 12 countries and uh, two international organizations, or a regional organization, the EU, and an international organization, NATO. And we compared uh, how these organizations do uh, preparedness for cyber emergencies. We needed to define um, cyber uh, emergencies, at least in terms of a working definition, and we really tried to encapsulate how um, these jurisdictions prepare 
prior to the emergency, what they do during, emer during an emergency, and how they recover from an emergency. And uh, you can see the, 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 the players on the stage. Um, Ido, I hope I spelled your name right. I practiced a lot. And um, just really quickly, what um, these aren't the most updated things, but you sort of can't see this. The, the, title, the, the title is indicative of the database that, was, uh, that is currently under construction here. I'm sorry, you can't read it. And the idea is to put uh, together under the auspices of Minerva a one-stop shop where um, you'll be able to see a screen, uh, tap onto a certain country, get a database of all of the cyber regulation that's relevant, click onto the cyber regulation itself and go into the actual um, updated laws or policies as, as, as the case may be. And then and here's where we really put in th thousands of hours, hundreds of hours, lots of hours. Um, a mapping out of how the, um, not only how the laws interact, but how the, you can see it up close here, how the actual um, ministries in a given country or other organizations interact. This is Estonia, by the way, you can tell by the flag. I think I got the flag right. So uh, what responsibilities for cyber emergencies does the Ministry of Internal Affairs have? Um, does the Prime Minister's Office have? And the different code color codes indicate whether we're talking about hard regulation by by law, by laws on the by uh, uh, formal laws, um, softer regulation, guidance, um, policy, um, best practices is indicated um, in a red color, and all of these links uh, will be on the as they are here on on the database that will eventually be available to everybody, they're live links. So you can actually click and see what's the latest policy, what's the latest law that's going on. And the interactions are what's really important. So I'll just give an example of where this got a little bit interesting. In cybersecurity, there are a lot of legacy regulators. So for example, in Australia, the Ministry of Justice, for some reason, is in charge of uh, critical infrastructure for cyber activities, which is things like banks and gas and water, what, any, what we would think of as critical infrastructure. So when a new cybersecurity, we don't have Australia here, but when we have a new uh, ministry being taking over certain cybersecurity authorities in Australia, there has to be some interaction with the legacy regulator, often contentious, to work out what kind of laws and what kind of policies are going to be applicable in a state of emergency when decisions need to be made really quickly. So the lines between the um, organizations are meant to show sort of what the dependencies are and the regulations are. So this is a project that I think, um, this is, is just to give you a sense, Israel, I know you can't read from up close, but it's really just to see how complex some of these uh, regulatory interactions are. So that's the, that's the promise. And um, I think within the next year, we're gonna go live, is that right? No, much month. closer. Oh. Before June 8th. Oh, point. do you want to say a word Tell about me. it? Wait, can you go back for sure. a minute? So, did, would you say that the complexity shows frictions or get, I mean, if, if you've compared 12, 12 countries and the maps look somewhat different, right. does the visual give you some insights on frictions or gaps? <coughs> or? That's, that's a great point. It doesn't. Um, partially because we approach the project as, law, as, as legal researchers and right. not real people. So it's hard. Some of your team would argue with that. Not to regular people. <laughs> <laughs> Reflecting those, um, those tensions, for example, the Ministry of Justice in Australia and how it's a legacy. Um, I think we would, need, non, we would ex need expertise that's non-legal. Um, that's number one. And number two, and these are all excuses, I think, it, I think that this is dynamic. Right. So for example, in Israel, there was war <laughs> between the new cyber bureau and, I mean, blood on the floor yeah. between the new cyber bureau and legacy. That has over time changed. So it, it's an interesting point. How do you reflect those dynamics within a chart like this? Um, I don't think it's that the lawyers would be the best people to... The background like to this that. was that we, at, at the same time that uh, the cyber team got this uh, Ministry of Science um, grant, uh, we got an earthquake uh, preparedness grant, which Michal and 
I'm known in Iran, Feitelson and, and uh, Ehud Segel worked on. What we did was our outputs are the same, use the same database. I mean, that's what will be online by June 8th. Wow. And um, for, uh, and so, but ours was high resolution. I mean, this is kind of mid resolution. It's comparing 12 different entities, whereas ours was just diving into a high resolution case study of Israel's regulatory framework. And we actually found that the visual also gave um, hints to the existence of frictions or gaps. Or how, did you sh how did you show that? And visually, it looks the same, uh. but it helped our analysis. And that was done through interviews and, and uh, wow. groups. OK, so no, maybe, maybe that's something we add. Um, when I say we, I mean not me. The royal. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, the people, the people who are not doing it. I think that that's really interesting. Um, to sum up this sort of first phase of uh, that culminated in this database and the maps, you can see on the left the countries and the jurisdictions that we dealt with, um, and we just had from. I'll, I'll put all of this up so they can move a little bit more quickly. We came to um, four um, sort of major conclusions about how jurisdictions, mostly countries, deal with the sole problem of uh, how do we regulate for cyber preparedness or, um, for emer through emergencies. Uh, number one, um, the, the first model would be uh, we're going to have one lead, uh, one ministerial level agency um, that sort of takes the ball and runs with it. It can be a new agency, it can be an old agency. Um, Singapore does this. They set up a uh, dedicated cyber ministry, if you will, and that's the um, the, the governmental entity that has both legislative authority and practical uh, responsibility for carrying out Singaporean cyber policy. So that's one model. Model number two is to um, have that lead agency recognize and work <coughs> with the legacy regulators so that it doesn't necessarily take away uh, authorities from existing ministries that already have relevant authorities. For example, Ministry of Finance, who might have, often in countries we saw, uh, had the first responsibility, the first kind of digital responsibilities, were for collecting taxes online. So that would be a Ministry of uh, Finance responsibility in many countries. So option two is let's get some work with the legacy regulator um, to continue. And that goes to the issue of the tensions and how it works out and, or doesn't work out. Model three, uh, coordination of the overall regulatory policy. Um, by leveraging legacy regulators um, with less hierarchy. So we're all doing this at the same level of responsibility and authority. And the final one was a tabula rasa approach, which Israel uh, undertook, which is really to um, try to sweep away existing regulators, the um, Israeli security agency, for example, that had responsibility for critical infrastructure. Um, and th those were some of the battles that took place. And uh, <coughs> Uh, interestingly, in the Israel model, the cyber authority was set up under the prime minister's office, so there was direct authority coming from the prime minister, and that kind of leadership was really, really critical. Um, we don't yet go into what models are most successful. This is sort of an, an observational situation. It was enough work to look at all the regulation and he, see sort of what comes out of the all of the regulation that we studied in terms of the modeling of how countries do this. So that was phase one. Um, I'm going to go ahead to phase two. These are the three uh, particular, more focused research projects that um, we undertook and wrote up. Um, for one and three, I'm going to give kind of a really brief summary just to get our foot in the water. So uh, we'll be a few slides on that, and then we'll do a deep dive into the property rights, uh, which was the paper that was sent around. So regulation of the cybersecurity professions, which sounds like a strange topic, but it was a really interesting one to research. I'll show you in a sec. And then the digital profiling, uh, data surveillance, and the curtailment of freedom of speech, really hard because it's a really a moving target at this point. And some of you may, have, may be researching um, different aspects of these topics. I'd be really glad to confer on any of them. So um, bear with me. I try, I'm trying to be really efficient about giving highlights, but feel free to interrupt or ask if things aren't clear. So on regulation of the cybersecurity professions, <coughs> Uh, how do we connect this to Minerva, Minerva as a crisis center, as a center that explores emergencies and crises? So um, 
we called this a real crisis uh, in uh, cybersecurity at the global level. Um, because of the global talent gap, and we'll get to some numbers in a second, we looked at national and organizational regulatory strategies for closing this really critical gap. Um, what countries seem to be doing is to set up accreditation schemes, which means that they're certifying people just like they certify doctors, lawyers, and accountants. Uh, they're moving towards a model of let's accredit or let's certify uh, cybersecurity experts, something that no one really considered a decade ago. And then we looked again uh, at how we model this, and we got uh, we came out of the, the project with five nested models, which I'll show you real quickly. This sounds really, really dry, um, so I want to get to the, per to the people part of this crisis. Um, this gap in cybersecurity has, has been long lamented. Um, currently, estimates are that globally there's a gap of 2 million cybersecurity experts uh, in order to raise the world level of cybersecurity to an, even a minimum. And when I say cybersecurity, I mean sort of that whole collection of policies and laws and best practices and um, standards that uh, help countries and organizations and international bodies um, protect themselves against hostile activity in cyberspace of the whole range of it, cyber crime, cyber terrorism. Um, so it's really a broad, a broad definition. Why is this gap important? Um, this is really, as I was preparing um, to think about how to present this, um, everyone in this room is a lawyer, correct? Almost yeah. everybody? Okay. Not, thank goodness. So this is a, this is a humble pie for the lawyers because um, I know that in, in the work that I do in, in a lot of the research that we do, you know, we, we deal with laws and policies and we say, okay, we've done our piece of the, of the work in terms of ensuring cybersecurity because we've, we've had our say and we know what's best and we know how a nation ought to protect itself and we do the policies and the best practices. But we don't do the work. And this, this slide and the next two or three slides are, are sobering to me because it's really about the people who need to actually be on the, the factory floor, if you will, and um, undertake what needs to be done in, in order to ensure uh, cyber, uh, cyber um, uh, computer networks all around the world, rather than just talking about it. So um, it, it is an important gap because without these 1.5 or 2 million people, however, you, however widely you want to estimate that gap, um, we can, we as lawyers and regulators can, um, can, can talk all we want, but the work doesn't get done. The 11% is the current percentage worldwide of women who are in, um, uh, in cybersecurity professions, and this is a list of the professions, we'll put it up really quickly so we know what we're talking about. And this is another gap that uh, is quite frequently referred to in the academic literature. Uh, cybersecurity professions, you can see the list, these are all the techies. Um, that we uh, that we read about so much, um, very few minorities, very few people of color, and very few women, uh, relatively few women, uh, globally speaking, which is more and more part of the academic and professional uh, conversation about how we change this and and why. <coughs> it's not just a nice to have. It's because there's more and more understanding at the strategic level that the more diverse population you have among your defenders, the better you can anticipate new, innovative, different kinds of cyber threats. And if you stay, you know, if you have sort of a one, one stance or one standard of the brain that's protecting, you're not doing the best job possible. So this is really a substantive issue uh, according to the academic literature. Um, the Economist had an article about this just to show sort of how, what this concern is. It's a real global concern. Uh, the Economist had this, I think it was last summer, and said a serious cultural change is needed in cybersecurity. And somehow they came to the conclusion that um, cultural, institutional, and unconscious biases are not all that difficult to correct. Um, if that's what the Economist thinks, then that's must be right. great, must be true. <laughs> uh, in Israel, we're, uh, this is to wrap this up, in Israel, of course, we're doing a little bit differently. We have about 30% of women, uh, probably not as much uh, non-gender diversity. Um, in Israel, but we've got time and we've got uh, Israel high tech grabbing whoever they can get out of the uh, out of 8200 to, to come and work for them. Um, so we're doing a little bit better than, than the world. So 
right now, just to wrap this piece up, there's no agreed accreditation requirements. It's pretty much a mess. There's no best practice in how you do certification at a global level. The private sector doesn't do without, and it obviously has accreditations. Um, it's, they're not hard to get. They cost money, but they're not hard to get. Um, and just to wrap this up, I don't want to be taking up too much brain space with this piece of work. It was, it was an interesting to, one to undertake. Um, we found five models of how countries are doing this now, and just to make it easy and without getting into the weeds of it. Um, very few countries are interested, I'll put all the conclusions up, very few countries are interested in mandating the way that um, uh, they mandate the medical profession, accounting professions, um, pharm pharmaceutical professions. Very few countries are at the point where they're willing to mandate national tests, national certifications for cybersecurity, and that's a problem. Sometimes in the legal context, it bumps up against freedom of profession. Um, there's a really interesting problem called the hacker problem, the desert generation problem that Israel has, has dealt with, um, which is that hackers, or uh, even the, the white hat hackers, the good guys who protect networks, maybe have never set foot in a training program. You know, they learned on their own and have world level expertise and have absolutely no interest in certifications in school. The Pentagon could not, cannot recruit hackers because of the security cl cl uh, clearances required. You probably have read the articles that I have about, you know, widespread drug use and that kind of stuff that just makes these folks really hard to, maybe not widespread, but occasional. Um, they make these folks really hard to put into work boxes. So in the Israeli sort of um, primary policy on how we uh, move ahead with this national challenge of how we get more and more cybersecurity folks trained, um, there's a, a category called the desert generation, Dohamid Bao. And if you're a white hat hacker um, who wants to be able to work, let's say, for a defense contractor in Israel, and you don't want to go get your certifications, you can come in and show your skills and um, get verified by the National Cyber Authority that, yeah, you're, you're, you're one of the professionals, and that's good for five years. You don't have to go get tested. But it's an interesting professional problem. Imagine that, for example, in the medical world, right? So you don't have to go to medical school and you don't have to qualify as a physician according to tests. We're just going to see if she can cure people um, in real life. So that would be the parallel. So that was project number one. Would it? It's not exactly I'm not sure parallel. it's a parallel. Remember the, the person who, who the imposter in Tel Shomer? There was a woman. In the oh, yeah. Wait, why do you think it up? Because uh, all the paramedical uh, professionals like uh, occupational therapy and physiotherapy, they want to get uh, everything accredited and registered. And you, it happened like five years ago, five, seven years ago. They passed a law and everything, and you had the people uh, a lot of experience. So, so what did they do then? If you had more than five years of experience, something like that, you get the accreditation. If you had okay, five years exactly of like that, same. you had to do a small test. But you had to go to school. You had to. Whereas here, you don't. Well, I mean, you have to, you have to graduate from accredited program. It's yeah. different. Maybe, I don't know, was there a ge desert generation no. for therapists? No. No, I don't think there was. No, 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 so, no, no. Yeah, this so desert generation doesn't have to okay, yeah. pass a test. That's different. Yeah. Um, so that was project number, that was um, specific project number one under the more general category. Um, any questions on it or um, comments? Maybe one, maybe. Excuse me? Uh, sure. Uh, by saying uh, cybersecurity, you are referring only to um, to software, software, right? Not to physical infrastructure. Also physical. So by by uh, you know, uh, discussing the uh, uh, manpower or the uh, agencies uh, in charge, and you you also include things like um, Russian submarines cutting uh, the the optical uh, fiber. Um, as a, oh. I'm not sure, on, I'm not clear on the question. As an attack on, on, on it, it certainly includes physical security, absolutely. But um, I'm not sure how the Russian submarine piece, but they don't have to cut anything, they can just listen. And normally the hacker no. will attack the vulner, uh, vulnerabilities in the, in the chips. Yeah. In the, so, 
it's so yeah, yeah, sure. But but I mean, uh, if you map the, the uh, dangers um, on the cyber arena, you can I mean you can harm uh, a country in, in, in quite a few different ways, right? So you can hack into their computers, you can disconnect them by, by cutting the submarine cable, you can bombard the, uh, the yep. uh, no, or, or, or turn the, the power uh, down, so they absolutely. also... Absolutely included. I mean, it's a great question, because a lot of people don't think of it that way. But uh, what, what solves that for me is it's cybersecurity is always a hybrid exercise. It's absolutely, um, there's a great little YouTube film on it of the, um, the, the disk on key, the USB. Right? Somebody leaves on the hospital floor by mistake. Oh, excuse me, a hacker, a, a black hat hacker, so an evil, an evil hacker, leaves mm. a, um, have you seen it? I don't know if no, you've no. seen it. So it, it's also about the USB that someone leaves on the floor and you know, uh, some nurse or some doctor even comes in and sticks it in to see to whom does this belong and the whole system goes. So the, the overwhelming answer is absolutely yes. It includes software, it includes uh, physical, it includes um, the activities of human beings. Does that answer? Yeah, so, th so uh, if, if we uh, discuss these uh, aspects of the problem, then what you call the legacy regulator would be the, the, the most relevant uh, body to... I'll give you a really quick example from Israel. If, okay. if, then tell me if I'm on target with this. Um, one of the places where Israel has, has moved ahead with its cyber defense, reg cyber protection regulation, is in the financial sector, the banks and the um, Shukahon, the capital markets. So, and that's interesting. I mean, around the world, also in cyber regulation, this is who we are as human beings. The first assets that get protected by cybersecurity regulation in, in countries generally is first financial markets and then health. So there you have it. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty consistent. It's not only Israel. Um, so in the Bank of Israel, uh, Directive 361, which came out in March 2015, um, there's very specific uh, uh, um, mandated, can you say mandated diamond? It, 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 it's a requ required for your cybersecurity person, whom you have to hire and who has to be very senior, senior and able to take responsibility, is responsible for both the virtual aspects of the, of the bank networks and the financial networks and the physical as well. So even, I mean, from my work I know this, one of the questions that we ask clients when we try to find out where they have vulnerabilities is, uh, and who thinks about this, the security cameras on the way into a bank, which are completely connected to the bank's um, um, computers. Da data is stored, data is collected. Uh, it's a great way to hack into a bank. So long answer to, a, to your question, but is that, does that answer it? Sure. Uh, how about when the, the government uh, himself uh, work as a hacker? Give me an example. Well, in NSA, they collected, uh, yeah. collected different mm -hmm. vulnerabilities. Yeah. Different vulnerabilities. It's allowed. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they also uh, have the agency. They, they can uh, they collect some companies. They they work as a hacker. Uh, maybe the white hat, yeah. hat, hat hacker. They collect the vulnerabilities. They test different. Uh, yeah, different the softwares and yep. then give this information to NSA, for example. And Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. On the one hand, uh, the government says as a um, regulator. It's very on, much on the line. Yeah, yeah. On the other, on the other hand, uh, yeah, he. Yeah. <laughs> well, we had. You're absolutely right, and it's very much. Um, we're going to skip this next one and just go to the heart of things because okay. the questions are really good. But to spend a second on that, we have something in the news in Israel from uh, this week. Uh -huh. that I'm really curious about. Maybe someone here, here has, has, um, has additional information. So I don't know if you saw the headline, but a 22-year-old um, Israeli hacker who's a former IDF, I guess he just got out of the army, IDF uh, computer expert, hacked into, what do I want to say? Hacked into... So I guess some, I, I'm from memory, sorry, memory's not what it used to be, but it's a very, very sophisticated IDF uh, computer systems. 
and he did it, he says, to show how vulnerable these systems are, exactly as you're, as you're explaining. And I understand that right now there's a real discussion going on whether he's going to be tried as a criminal or not tried as a criminal. And it's exactly your point that you need hackers, whether they're white hat, black hat, or gray hat, yeah. is a question of, you know, at what, what, t what hour of the day do you catch them, right? Technion students hacked ways to show that it could be done and then gave it to the, the company so that they weren't, but I mean... Yeah. It's very controversial and it's, it's an important legal issue that a lot of countries get mucked up in because the legislation isn't clear, but it's definitely something to... Yeah, because uh, I also have uh, read some papers that uh, the, uh, some economists uh, did some, some uh, research that uh, the, uh, they, they said that it's because of the involvement of the government that the, the uh, black market is booming, booming up. So, ah, because the government was, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. because they piled up a lot of vulnerabilities, a lot of exploits, yep. and uh, when just like the NSA, uh, they uh, they uh, released it. I mean, uh, I mean, did, uh, some some hacker hacker the the, 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 the database of, of uh, NSA, right. then they, which uh, is the uh, NSA's problem that yeah, they're yeah, hackable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I agree, and it's very and again, I mean, your point really goes to. And maybe we should probably wind up the cybersecurity professions. It sounds like a really boring topic when you look at the just you know regulating a profession. How interesting could that be? But these are the real. I mean, you've all brought up these issues that are really well. Who's sitting in front of the computer screen? What capabilities do they have? What responsibilities do they have legally and ethically? And how do we train them so that we have enough of them on the good side? to protect countries and other jurisdictions going into the future. And the one point is, uh, sure. what is the, the, the incentive? Some people, some, some hacker for, for the profit, right. or some people um, just for fun, or, or right. uh, another party just like right. the, the, right. The, the government. So I mean, this is something, I mean, yeah. maybe. Uh, it's, and it's a real, it's a, uh, again, coming out of this research, it's a real regulatory challenge to sort that out. Yeah. You know, if you don't have tests, what are you going to do, personality tests? You know what? Um, I guess maybe it's like, I haven't looked at this, but hearing, hearing your questions, maybe it's like how we train lock keepers. And, you know, mm. when are lock keepers on the right side of the <laughs> fence and when are they not on the right side? I don't know. <laughs> um, so let's move into the case, the promised case study. And again, I'm, um, I'm really at your, at, your, at your mercy here. Um, this is very different from the cybersecurity issues that I usually study. But I, I think... I think um, um, I'm hoping that you'll find, find it interesting. Um, this topic about property rights in cyberspace was very hard, and Ido, you remember the discussions, I think, um, with you and with Amnon, of connecting this up to um, the raison d'etre of the, of the Minerva Center, and I just want to be really transparent about that. So if we're talking about digital property, and we'll get in a second to how that's defined and how it acts and why we care, um, and it's ne the need to regulate the digital property, and um, I'll talk, these are sort of the headlines. We'll talk about uh, how the first instance of regulatory intervention is really when digital property, as we'll define it, needs to be transferred, and that's mostly, up until now, the concern has been when people are either incapacitated mentally or have moved on to a better world, which is a little bit um, morbid, but that's when the regulator starts to get interested. Um, and also to tax digital property, of course, but mostly when people are moving on to uh, other phases of their law, of their existence. Um, and we're going to see in, in the next few, few minutes that there are really lacuna, there's really gaps in existing regulatory regimes that don't satisfactorily resolve this very, very critical issue. Um, and we'll look at four countries who currently regulate it. Um, what's the problem here? What's unusual, what's unusual about these regulatory lacuna? What's the sub substantive challenge in terms of uh, digital property rights? Is this an emergency or a crisis? And the answer that I, I've been able to come up with, we'll see if I can convince you, is that this isn't an emergency in the sense, in the physical sense. It's not earthquakes, it's not floods. Um, but I think it is a substantive or normative emergency. And um, I'll give some numbers to back that up or to try to back that up, just because we have so many uh, so much of our data, um, our digital assets uh, out there uncontrolled. They're worth so much money. 
uh, and we're talking about finances here, and that there's a huge gap in working with those two values, the quantity and the quantity, excuse me, quantity and the, um, the worth, the monetary worth of these assets, um, that uh, I'll stretch the definition a little bit and call it a normative emergency, that this really needs to be taken care of. So we'll start with, to set us up, we'll start with a quote from John Barlow, who wasn't a lawyer. Uh, he wrote a seminal article in Wired magazine in 1994 called The Economy of Ideas. And uh, we can just read this together. He wrote, through the, throughout the time I've been groping around cyberspace, he's a, a cyber, cyber pioneer, an immense unsolved conundrum <clears throat> has remained at the root of nearly every legal, ethical, governmental, and social vexation to be found in the virtual world. I refer to the problem of digitized property. The enigma is this. If our property can be infinitely reproduced and instantaneously distributed all over the planet, without cost, without our knowledge, without it even leaving our possession, how do we protect it? So that's the conundrum that uh, really interested me at the beginning of this research. And the more I think about it, and I think about some, of the, some pieces of this problem actually a lot, divorced from the property issue. Um, this is really where the, the, the issue of big data or huge data, and we'll get some numbers in a second, um, meets that concept of property and ownership. Um, we're talking about trillions of US dollars globally um, that in, that, in that sort of merger. Um, the OECD has said that the digital economy, which does not separate out digital property, there's a lot of inexactness in measuring this, these pieces of property, 6% uh, growth of member economies, that was two years ago, it's probably more by now. The best study that um, we could find on really saying how, what is, how much is digital property worth is a UK study from 2011, uh, which said that uh, Brits, it was, a, it was a good solid, solid survey with a lot of, uh, uh, I think, um, um, I, I can send it to you if you'd like, but they asked a lot of people. Um, 2.3 billion uh, pounds uh, invested in what people call their own digital assets that were either sentiment that they had either sentiment about or wanted to protect otherwise in um, through their wills or through contracts or other or other ways. And again, I, I, this is a little bit theoretical, but I'll get down to the to the real stuff in a second. Um, Ah, I wanted to mention here, Michal, I couldn't find this, maybe you could help. About a month ago, I think you distributed, or, or maybe Neva distributed, an article that was written by one of the researchers here or at the law faculty on new forms of property. And it was about millennials preferring um, access to, uh, to exclusive possession. Do you remember that article? No. I know it came from Haifa, so I knew it was. Um, so I just wanted to tie in into... Um, and the right-hand circle, uh, what this article taught me that we're really rethinking all of our ideas about property and ownership. And property eventually, not only in the digital context, is really becoming divorced in a lot of ways. And I'm not an expert in this, but I read a good article on it that came from here, um, that we're really be thinking about what our relationship to property is and how, um, uh, how it is somehow becoming more and more divorced from actually physical ownership and more about access or other kinds of rights. And I'll stop there because um, it's not my legal field. If, if you want to jump in, that would be fine. So these are really, these two circles really represent for me two, two basic questions that really fed into the research question for this project. Um, a moment on the new regulatory reality. So most of us know this. Um, this chart is the ITU uh, estimate of how many people are online uh, in the developed world and the non-developed world. Um, the developed world is way up above. Uh, there's, this is the digital gap that uh, we hear about a lot. But really, at the, the bottom line is that almost half of humanity, 47% of us, are online, which means that all of that big data and, um, um, and property issue, that meshing, matters to a lot of people because uh, since we're all connected, as we'll see in a second, we all have digital assets. It's not a first world problem. And increasingly, you can see that this line is going up and up and up. Increasingly, probably somewhere in 2030, we'll have 100% uh, human con connectivity to the internet one way or the other, through phones, through computers. So this is really a global problem. It's not just a first world problem. Whoops, sorry. Um, a little bit about data. Just to get a sense, this is kind of 
this blows me away. Global volume of data in March 2016 is measured in zettabytes. I don't know what zettabytes are. Um, it's a lot of data. Um, and then I found this. So this is really zettabytes, which sounds huge. Um, if we're looking at um, the Internet of Things, which is sort of with, already with us, zettabytes are only here. We're looking in the next few years, moving on to things called yottabytes, brontobytes, and geobytes. I can't even pronounce these things. This is not to show off about new words, but when we read about this geobyte, for example, that it's going to take us out of the decimal system, my brain doesn't go that far. And where this hits home as a, as a lawyer for me is to think that we have these objects, these digital objects, digital assets. They're not all personal. They're not all personal property. There are a lot of other things as well. Um, we can imagine that there there are other assets belonging to corp corporate entities and a bunch of other stuff. Um, if we can't even grasp the quantities, and I can't, maybe you can, the quantity of of data that is um, going to be existent within uh, a very short time, how do we even begin to think about regulating it, organizing rights therein? So I think it's a real substantive problem. Um, I get stuck on this a lot. Um, in addition, the costs of particular data breaches, and this is more connected to data, digital assets, is, just, is rising all the time. So an individual data breach in 2017, um, $225, what does that mean? This is just to indicate that this, these breaches, this loss of digital property is expensive. Um, and again, the estimates are not good. We just don't have the data on the data yet. Um, one more slide on the conceptual challenge, because again, these, these I think are, are, for me anyway, really confusing ideas. When we talk about digital assets, are we talking about data as a tool or a weapon, a product or a commodity that we can sell and buy, uh, a property? Negotiable good, part of my identity. So this is the Michael Jackson problem, which I've talked about in this room a little bit more. What's the Michael Jackson problem? So Michael Jackson, the singer, dancer, performer, as a digital entity today, is making more money than he ever made in his lifetime. Uh, he can sign contracts. He can appear in a hologram and perform. That's all data. Is it his property? Is it part of his identity? Is it a contract that he has with whoever's producing the hologram? We don't know yet. Uh, this is like the background of everything that I looked into when um, I sort of threw out this working definition of what a data digital asset is. So it has to do two things. It has to be, um, it has to have an ostensible owner. Someone has to want to own this data. And there's a lot of data that nobody really wants to own, nobody really cares about it. And it has to have a quantifiable monetary value. So enough of the... Um, Theory, what do we mean? This is a, um, we have three slides on this. Uh, this is a accounting sheet that the attorney James Lamb hands out. He's the only one I found out who does this. He hands out to his clients when they want to make a will that includes their digital assets. It's nine pages long. I've taken, I wanted to photocopy it, but you can get it online really easily. So let's take a look at what we're talking about when we talk about these digital assets. So he talks, it's really easy stuff that, as we're going through the categories, think through your head how much this stuff might be worth in your own lives. So computer passwords, probably not worth a lot of money. Um, email accounts, probably not. Social networking accounts, um, if we have them, probably not worth, at least mine aren't worth a lot of money, but probably maybe some people have pictures or, or um, uh, other assets that they store there. Financial accounts, okay, yeah, we're starting to get my bank accounts, my credit card accounts. They're digital. They're not physical. They certainly have value. Would, would I like to, maybe the test would be, would I like to pass them on to my, um, to my descendants when I move on to a better world? Probably, yeah. My domain names, web pages and blogs, for sure. How many people in the room have cached domain names to sell them for a fortune at a later time in their lives? There you go, thank you. <laughs> right? Worth a ton of money, at least potentially. No, Will be. Yeah. Right, right. You don't want to lose that. Would you have thought to put that in your will, in your legacy? Well, I pay for it annually, so you know, it's worth something. Okay. I wouldn't have paid otherwise. 
I had that whip stacked for many years ago. Okay. Yeah. Would you have thought to put it in your will? Uh, but it's only for, for the commercial. Yeah. yeah. Um, online storage accounts. This is where it starts to get really, really interesting because mm. Dropbox, Google Drive, mm -hmm. even if it's not IP, you have documents that are worth value or pictures or creations of your own. Um, of course, it's worth value means worth value to who? Exactly. Can you monetize it? If you can monetize it, then it's got money. Think about this stuff. This is really, this starts to get to it. PayPal. How many people have PayPal accounts? So PayPal, in its terms of use, it's a Luxembourg company, and this is in the paper that, that um, was sent out for today. PayPal considers uh, your account, we ha and you can have credits in PayPal, right? Um, they consider it a digital asset to the extent that if someone um, is, uh, again, passes on, I guess we'll say it that way, and does not claim their digital account from PayPal, or their estate does not claim the digital estate from PayPal within two years, um, that money goes to the state of Luxembourg. It's, yeah, check it out. Okay. <laughs> um, different arrangements in Barnes & Noble. You get refunds, Amazon, you get refunds, you get credits, you get benefits. Um, we'll go down the list and you'll see each one of you is sort of calculating in your head. Um, your digital music and other media, media accounts, usually, there was, this was a famous case um, in, the, in, in Los Angeles, usually um, Apple iTunes and Amazon, Kindle, etc., those sort of proprietary platforms don't let you take those digital assets out. So even if you have the best playlist in the universe and you've put thousands of hours into putting it together, um, it turns out you cannot, um, by, by contract with these good companies, you cannot pass it on as part of your digital legacy. Um, but there's more. And this list that um, Mr. Uh, Attorney Lamb put together does not even begin to scratch the surface. Think about Bitcoin. He put his list together before Bitcoin. Uh, hotel and airline loyalty schemes, again, we trivialize them, they can be worth thousands of dollars. Uh, the domain names cache we already talked about, um, freebies that we get, um, online platforms that retain funds and balances. Does anybody know about the platform Upwork? It's a, uh, I use it, it's great. It's a matching service for people who want to do work online and people who want to pay for it. So I do, uh, I hate doing my blue book footnotes for legal articles. There are a thousand people on Upwork who want to do it. So. It's a payment system, but you can also have um, money left over after work or refunded to you, et cetera. The point of all of this exercise is to get us thinking about how digital assets that we have, we have accumulated as digital beings, as you know, part of that curve of the 47% of humanity who are online, is that we have these assets that, as time goes on, will grow in, uh, in financial worth. And whereas in the past, we might have been able to say, okay, well, we have other legal regimes that can treat these assets and take care of them, IP protection, privacy protections, uh, digital right management protections. This new category of rights is largely untouched by these three legal regimes. And that's what's so interesting about it. So for example, I have just a few, um, a few, uh, um, um, uh, articles to get us thinking. So under the World um, Intellectual Property Organization, the WIPO Article 2 definition of what IP is, think about this as you're thinking about your virtual assets, your digital assets. These are rights relating to, you can see the long list of inventions and innovations, um, and all other rights that result, and here's the test, from intellectual activity in the industrial, scientific, literary, or artistic fields. My hiring someone on Upwork is not covered by this article. It has nothing to do with creativity. Or am I getting a hotel, an extra night in a hotel, or you know, money to spend at, a, at the hotel of my choice as an online benefit, as a digital asset, has nothing to do with intellectual property. Okay, so we're treating this briefly, but in general, inter IP protections that are robust in international law and in most legal systems don't cover the kind of digital assets that we're talking about. Any questions on that? Okay. The second avenue that we might look at that, would, that, that, that may have a chance of covering digital assets 
is uh, protected personal data, which is the big hoo-ha. Yesterday, Israel's, uh, Israel's new regulations came into force that bump up our protection of personal data. The GDPR, which is the European um, General Data Protection Regulation, coming into force at midnight on May 25th. Um, big deal. Uh, defined in Article 4 what personal data is. Let's check that out. Do digital assets come under the category of personal data? So this Article 4 says it's any information that can identify you as a natural person. So first of all, natural person, this is the footnote that's not on the slide, the GDPR only applies to people who are alive, natural people, and individuals, not, corpor not corporations. And it's defined as an identifier such as a name, an ID number, location data, physiological and physical data, mental, economic, or social identity doesn't cover digital assets. Covers some of them at an interesting level, and here I'd love your help in conceptualizing this. So personal data, for example, uh, an online identifier of one of us in PayPal, right? A code, your, your, your access numbers, um, you may have a name of your PayPal account. That's personal information that's covered by the GDPR. But your actual digital asset that has financial worth, to my best understanding, is not covered by the definition of personal data. So again, digital assets outside of the realm of, um, of the personal data regulation. So countries have, this is the, enough of the definitions, a few countries, very few, have started to move ahead with thinking about this. And this is where the emergency part comes in. Uh, because of the countries that we surveyed, uh, and we went beyond the group of 14, these are the only four who've even started the process. Israel has had a discussion in the, as far as I know, has had a discussion in the Knesset, uh, one or two, hasn't moved ahead with it. Um, and other countries, again, as far as I know, I'm happy to have new information from anybody in the room or beyond the room, countries are not paying attention to this. And just to, you know, why is that important? Again, because of the quantities of data and the, and the, and the value of this data. So uh, interesting that people are approaching their, uh, their um, the attorneys who are doing their wills for them, their, their, their um, last wills and testaments, and saying, I, have, I know I have this stuff. I filled out um, attorney Lamb's form. What do I do with it? Um, so initially the the uh, entities in these four countries that started to deal sorry the the three on the right that start in the US in the UK and in Germany who started to deal with these issues are the attorneys who, who write wills and they said we need a solution for this the bar associations were the one who started started being interested not the legislatures mm -hmm. so these three are bar association papers France is the only country in the world it says, yeah, we recognize these digital assets and we recognize that you have rights in them. Um, taxation is starting to become an issue because countries want a piece of the action, but it's still very, very nascent. So I won't go into the details on, this, on the particular um, uh, pieces of um, bar association papers that have started to deal with this. France's Article 69 in its Digital Republic Bill, which is a really cool law, um, any person may lay down instructions for the retention, erasure, and transmittal of his personally identifiable data, data after his death. And digital assets are defined in the, specifically in Article 69.3 of that law. France is the outlier, the only country that actually makes provision for this. Uh, in Israel, and we're coming towards the end, I'm really interested to hear what you have to think. Um, the law of inheritance in Israel um, is is um, is silent on the issue of virtual assets versus physical assets. So there's no barrier, but there's no active uh, treatment of digital assets um, in the law of inheritance currently. The Knesset, as I said, has met uh, under the auspices of the Science Committee, which is kind of interesting. And I just saw an ad by the ILO Insurance Company in the past week that uh, is marketing a digital safe for your digital assets that you want to protect online. Um, I wouldn't, I'm not an investment advisor, but I wouldn't put my money in there. Um, so, so you can see this is really just, it's not even buds. It's a sort of um, uh, situation of concern for regulators, I think, uh, here and in other places, just because there's not enough attention paid for it, paid to it, and it is an issue that is um, uh, certainly going to 
grab more of our attention as time goes by. So these are the, uh, the conclusions. You've already heard most of them that I've said. Um, and I'm going to wrap up and get some discussion. Um, I'm still stuck on what data is. And I think most of what I, I have not seen a, a uh, regulatory or legal system that has its head wrapped around even the different pieces of what data is. Um, and that is, I think, one of the challenges of the next, the next few decades. That's what I think. Uh, how do we deal with super big data uh, in its interaction with property and ownership? And how do we re-understand property and ownership in this context? And with that, I'll conclude and ask if there are any questions. Thanks for your attention. Fascinating. Questions? Or help. <laughs> um, <laughs> Be, be starting out on this project, again, coming off of the other much more um, legally robust research projects within the Minerva, under the Minerva Aegis, um, I did have those dark moments of, is this really a thing? I mean, is this really, uh, these data, these digital assets, is this really something that should concern us? Or is it just a made up uh, situation? And the more and more I read, uh, I started to see that the academics aren't yet there, but the practitioners certainly are, because people are more and more understanding that they really want to uh, pass on to the next generation, or if they're, uh, you know, making arrangements for incompetence. Um, and again, we're a little bit morbid. How do I deal with all of this stuff that I've accumulated in in cyberspace that I don't want to just leave leave out there and hanging? And, and besides that, it's worth money. So. I think it's real. I'm happy to hear otherwise if you have any thoughts about where we put this in the puzzle of, uh, of cyberspace and emergencies and criticality. I guess I still struggle with the concept of value. Um, you know, even the, like property, I guess I'm struggling with the concept of value. It's, it's hard. <laughs> Look, when it's, your, when it's your visa account and you know how much extra money you have in, there's a value on it. Right. I mean, there are all those accounts, like in the States, they have these, these websites where you can go and see if you have any credit left over from the places that you never knew about. You oh, know, really? a store. Yeah, a store. There My you mother go. actually found on, on a website that I had a $10, um, some gift certificate from some okay. store that I hadn't used for 30 years and she must have spent 48 hours trying to apply to get the $10 <laughs> back. I mean, which I really, but I mean, so they have all these websites where they go through, uh, you know, it's not virtual, but you know, they're, they're listed someplace, things that people lost that are, or, right. or have no idea that they ever had. It's a, I guess the, for the lawyers, that's oh, we get we you know we're on that because you have a right to that. And yeah. again, it's it's little bitty pieces. It's ten dollars, and it's you know a, a, a hotel, a free hotel night, cumulatively. And that's the point about the big data, yeah. the huge data, cumulatively. We're in the trillions of dollars. Right. That, I mean, that, I, but I struggle as you do. I mean, I just, so so. What if I have ten dollars in a you know? Okay, but at least from? I mean, even though you know, who knows, ten dollars thirty years ago, how much? It, <clears throat> but for instance, if I have a Dropbox account, I mean, if I were to lose a Dropbox account where I didn't have a copy of a manuscript I was writing, it would be worth a lot to me. To retrieve it, but it wouldn't be worth anything to anybody else. Right. So, so that's not what the digital. That would not be, be considered yeah, a digital asset. The, right. Okay. Right. Dropbox for what it contains, and you have to be. We have to be careful because so it's if it contains it IP, that's different. That doesn't count. If it contains, you know, your collection of all the ten dollars is that you accumulate. Okay. So that has value. But as time again, we're at the beginning of this curve. And we don't know, I mean, in 10 years, um, instead of your mom having to search the web for days to find out how she gets the $10 back, just like now we have our, our um, in Israel, we have these digital uh, bank identity cards. Now all banks in Israel allow you to do an identity card to see all of your financial assets, just like that. Really? With, yeah, 
I'll show you how to do it. Um, <laughs> Never heard of it. Very, very quickly, since, um, very, very quickly, we're going to be able to see all of these assets in one place. So sort of 10 years down the line, this will be as easy as checking your bank account. You'll be able to know exactly where all of your digital assets are. How do we start to think about this? Is it important to start, is it important to, start to think about it? Is it simply, well, you know, um, I'm, I'm still paying my mortgage on my house. That's the financial interest that I have in, um, in property. And I don't particularly care about my leftover uh, credit card accounts and, and how much money I have in Barnes & Noble because I got a bonus. Um, how did you come up with the idea? Um, I was really, st thank you for asking. I can see you're all sort of dumbstruck. <laughs> and I know I also, again, you don't even remember the discussions. And, and Amnon also said, well, does this really fit? And uh, I worry about it, but I think I came up with this because I started to see in the literature um, the discussions on what data is. So to take it to a different context, which might be a little more alarming or clearer, um, in, in cyberspace, when we look at um, data as means of warfare or terrorism, um, where bits and bytes are used to take down the Ukrainian electrical grid, uh, as it was in uh, December 2015, or um, the Stuxnet um, uh, event that took place. When we look as, at data as a weapon and have to ask questions about how we're going to treat that, those bits and bytes, those pieces of code uh, under legal systems, under the laws of war, for goodness sakes, then um, that kind of opened up my brain to think about, okay, well, what are some other uses of data that we don't usually look at uh, on, in, in legal terms and how we organize them? Now, the laws of war actually around how we use data in, in a war uh, context are pretty clear. I mean, there are arguments about them, which we can have, but you got a lot, a lot to chew through. You know, you, you know, uh, know about proportionality, is the, I don't want to go into the details, but you know what to do with it. In the financial context, I think we're much less at a loss, and that's part, partly the reason why I really wanted to get into it, because intellectually it's sort of, how do we, we've got all this data, we're going to have a lot more, uh, it's worth money to, to certain people, and it's going to be worth more as time goes on to all of humanity, how, are we, how do we start to think about it? So I guess it was, short answer was how, how do we meet this intellectual challenge uh, as, as attorneys? So that's, that's how I got started with it. Um, but it may be a non-starter. I don't know. <laughs> Anybody have any thoughts? I, have, uh, I think it's more of a thought than a question. But yeah. uh, it's in front of call. You're talking about basically digital property. And when it comes to regular property, I have a right to own property. When it comes to digital property, it's ambiguous at most. So when it comes to the application of human rights and the state's obligation to protect and respect the human rights with regard to that property, I find it very interesting because you have a lot of test cases from, from the, when I die and what happens to my property, but also ransom uh, software. Where hackers take my property and say, if you don't pay for it, right. So does the government or have a right, has obligation to protect me from, from yeah. these kind of yeah. uh, operations? And the entire framework of the application of human rights to di digital is interesting. This is uh, what Anna and I are working on in the context of cyber. Remember the lecture that you left and you were here in the conference in Jerusalem? That I what? Did you, I? you left and you didn't hear me. <laughs> How could you I remember it. I remember it. I remember it really well. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, you don't. Uh, but this is a very interesting aspect of the whole notion of having digital uh, property rights, digital property and digital property rights. Towards it, I wonder to what extent does it uh, incorporate into your reason. So it bri that point really brings to mind um, a crazy example from Israeli law, which is a typical one. And... Um, it's, it's from the law of, it's from the penal law, and it's the definition in, under Israel's criminal law of stealing. So when you, you're, you, you can, you're charged with stealing as a crime when you have, um, you're going to have to help me with the translation, um, 
I'll try to translate myself. When you um, disallow the owner's access to that object in perpetuity. I hope that's the translation, which goes to your ransomware thing. So I steal these cookies. No one else can have them because I have them. If I steal digital a digital asset, steal a digital asset, I may have only copied it. I may and have it still be with you. Anybody can use it. I made a copy. I've uh, um, and the owner cannot use it. This is the, the problem. If you deny access, then it will worth a lot of money to the right. owner. Which to goes to the malware thing. Yes. But I can also steal data. I mean, there's a. Um, I'll, I'll give the case loss, and maybe this will um, encourage some more questions. So, a really inter a really memorable uh, piece of case law in Israel on what stealing is. It was before the judge uh, Eddie Rubinstein was no longer on the Supreme Court, but um, he was one of the first judges who said, we really need to take care of this issue of what, how we think about data in cyberspace. And the issue was the following, and you'll never forget this because it's a cool story. So uh, the Israel Medical Association gives, as we referred to these examinations before, gives a qualifying exam for doctors every so often. Um, a a Russian-speaking couple, they were doctors, um, got work as the translators of the uh, Hebrew exam into Russian. And they translated it, but they also sold it, right, sold it, on, sold it online. The students. Right. Um, and they were caught, and they were hauled into court for stealing the exam. And don't worry, we got them in the end on something else. But Elie Rubinstein said, the fact that they sent out copies of this exam, mm -hmm. virtual copies, um, doesn't mean that they stole them. In fact, they do not meet the requirements of stealing under Israeli law because anybody else could have, could have used the exam. It was still in the file. It was still in the virtual safe that the medical organization used to, to test people. They had made a copy and taken it offline and sold it. But how is that different from the case of the teacher in Yagor yeah. a couple of years in ago math. in math? Um, she was actually my daughter's homeroom, homeroom teacher. What? She, and what did she do? She's a lovely person. Um, I mean, my daughter had already graduated by then. She uh, was among the creators of the Bagrut questions, and she shared. Um, questions with her. Some of her questions. She consulted with someone who helped her write the exam. Helped her write yeah. the exam. It wasn't, it wasn't, she didn't give it to the students. No, he, he, he did. Yeah. She needed help creating this exam. She asked one of her colleagues or friends, and he, in turn, when he was tutoring kids mm -hmm. who were right. about to take the exam, let them know. She was. I mean, this was not a question. She was guilty. But I she mean, wasn't guilty she of stealing. Steal, but she w Yeah, but she I was think that, the, that it's clear in this case that, that the state has the right to fail. But here, we're talking about these transnational organizations. So, so what you're assuming is that the, the state of Israel should tell PayPal that if I have an account on PayPal or the PayPal I'm interested in how you know it is written into the code. So when I enter PayPal in 10 years, it will tell me once you die, your money goes to. You can go in right now. Yeah. And read it. I, I read and the terms of use. It's in the terms of use of PayPal. Okay. No, it's not what. No, it's it, but it, it they they but allow you. The they say if you translation. I mean, when they were given the rights to translate. There was no non-disclosure. I'm sure there was. So the issue here is around the. Of course, they did something wrong. They again. Yeah, I, yeah. I I went to the end really quickly. I said we got them. They right. they, they, they. But it was um, it was misuse of, um, of of different rights of com of a computer. I think it was under the computer code. But it wasn't stealing. It was something else. But just to get to finish the, 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 the PayPal point is piece. Just that, that with okay. data, stealing yeah. is different, right? Yeah, stealing yeah, is not disallowing. It. It. There's yeah. more, more of it. There's so, more but we need new, we need new concepts right. of how to right. deal with it. Do. For PayPal, you have two years to um, 
or your estate has two years to deal with whatever change you have left over in PayPal. At the end of the two years, and you can go in right now and read the terms and conditions of PayPal. Um, if not, it goes to Luxembourg. So. Um, yeah, but, but what I'm asking is, since legislation is national, and we're talking about transnational corporations, so what kind of relationship that's are a great we question. between them? That's a great question. Um, I, well, if I understand it, then you're asking about it's a jurisdictional question about how how do you claim how do we claim our property if it's beyond the the borders of our of the country the particular country we live in. I am not an expert in inheritance law, but inheritance lawyers know how to do that. So if you own and I know you own a um, a castle in Switzerland, sure. and you, um, you don't want to just let Switzerland have it after you move on. Um, there are ways to make sure that that happens under ordinary inheritance law. So when we have physical property, there are answers. It's, but your question really goes to the heart of a lot of the jurisdictional issues in cyberspace on, on all kinds of things. Contracts. Where is a digital contract signed? That contract with PayPal that you signed, where is it signed? In Luxembourg, in Israel, somewhere in the air between. You know, there's an interesting book by Aaron Kellerman about the geography of the internet where he he wrote it a number of years ago. It was in the 90s. Yeah. But he kind of talks about these type of... I'm going to take a look at it. Yeah. I read it too long ago. The jurisdictional issues are thorny but, um, but doable. It, that's a huge, hugely superficial statement. But for example... Um, in the Talon Manual, when we looked at the laws of war in cyberspace, chapter two was jurisdiction, chapter two was sovereignty of states in cyberspace, and chapter two was jurisdiction. How the heck do you work out where these contracts are signed? Or where a, uh, via, where a, a hostile act in cyberspace takes place, you know, we can even go more virtual. You know, there's not even an asset. There is a use of data that's hostile. It starts in... Um, North Korea, it pings around China, and it ends up in Israel. Where does it take place? Who has responsibility as a state for protecting it, et cetera, et cetera? So that was one of the first issues that was really, that, that was really hard and thorny. There are legal answers. They're not great ones, but there are legal answers. So um, it's the same, same principles as a cross-national crime, and you know, the sort of the, the cheap shot example is you know, um, the academic example of someone is standing in Texas and pulls out his gun, it's always a he, and shoots someone in Mexico, whereas he tried, and you know, it's not a joke, but um, so, so there are rules, there are jurisdictional rules, and um, there are ways to work that out. In cyberspace, it gets harder because of the transit. So any given act in cyberspace, hostile, not hostile, buying digital assets uh, on PayPal, goes through multiple jurisdictions at the rate of several a second, possibly. So it gets thornier, it gets more complicated. We're certainly not there with the answers yet, but there's a mode of thinking legally that allows you to, to sort things out a little bit. Does that, that, that I tried not to whitewash it, but um, uh, there, there are, two, are legal tools that are usable as well. Isn't the default is regular uh, private international law, where all in all terms of use, you see in the last line, every uh, disagreement will be in this court, in this, uh, under this law. So this is the default, this is the start. Then you get complicated because part of the data is here, part of the data is there, and... They but, have the, but there's one court that pulls it all together. Yeah. A problem is that we're also seeing, and this is getting off topic a little bit, but maybe we should, we'll take another maybe five minutes and then wrap, because um, I see that people are sort of stunned. Um, now we're getting virtual courts in order to deal with this, these just juris jurisdictional issues that are transnational. So go online and we'll have virtual judges, or real people, right? But judges who hear the case, uh, sorry, you can't even use the words hear the case, who read the case online, have the facts, and make a, issue a learned opinion and there are, there are companies and private people who opt into this jurisdiction because it's quick, it's easy. Um, one judge may be working in Singapore and another judge may be working in 
uh, in Mexico, so they can also work 24 seven. And it speeds up your jurisdictional processes. And if you accept that decision, you don't need a state, right? It's like kind of a, a trans jurisdictional thing. And we're gonna see that more and more. And maybe that ties into, you know what, I'm gonna take that away as maybe something, as a takeaway for this digital assets piece. So maybe the jurisdictional solutions start to happen virtually completely. It goes against every theory of evidence law, basically. Excuse me? It goes against every theory of, of How's evidence that? law. Well, it deals a lot with the personal impression, with the, the fundamental question of how does a judge know if you're lying or telling the mm. truth. And that goes to your voice and the face mm. makes okay. and the movement of your eyes and all these factors that are that you can't do online. So again, here's the easy answer to that. Of years of theory of do a hologram. Well, just... You give evidence if it's not only a documents-based... I'm way out on a limb here because I don't... Do they have programs for, like, holograph now? Like of course. You... Yeah, you just plug course. yourself into... Wow, that's Of course. Scary. Even more, an evidentiary, and this is way off topic, but I'll just... I was talking about this with my in-laws last night, and they said, what do you mean this exists? So Alexa, right? Yeah. The... The robot. Uh, the robot <laughs> that sits in your house, and you say, you know, my mom says, yeah. Alexa, turn on the lights, and tell me a joke, and whatever. This is already old news, and maybe some of you know much more about this than I do, but about a year ago, a court in California called Alexa as a witness in a criminal trial mm -hmm. wow. because Alexa was in the house when a crime occurred. And guess what? Alexa recorded everything. Oh my God. You're so, again, it's like that, it but it's like the voices and right. questions. It's not a, it's not a tone of wow. voice, but yeah. to your point, tone of voice, yeah. rhythm of speaking, maybe it wasn't a picture, yeah, but. Yeah. The volume, like. Can tell oh, if you're angry or happy or wow. It's, it's like a recording system. It's not a witness in that sense, right? It's like a camera. You would tell. But you can judge. Yeah, it can well, judge if if I'm if I'm saying if you and I are going to say the same word, but the first time I'm going to say it, I'm going to shout, and second, I'm going to say it really um, quietly, or I'm going to try to sound angry or happy or sad. It can pick up on that. It's sensitive enough, some problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, AI is a, bit, is a problem for for what we're talking about, but I'm saying that in that trial, that particular case, it was like, you know, you, you use a camera for, you know, to deal with robots. At this point, at this yeah. point, but I'll tell yeah. you, one of the scarier things that I learned, and we're way off topic, but that's okay. Um, one of the scarier things that I learned in some of the... Um, the, the, the law in my law practice is that we have some client we've had a client lately who runs a um, runs call centers and call centers uh, sophisticated call centers call centers have um, um, AI backup I was astounded to learn this again sort of what do you mean they know how to do this um, the algorithms for judging whether a call with a consumer is going well or not going well. And the message into the earphones of the, f the human saying, slow down your tone of voice a little bit, or tell a joke now. Um, tensions are heating up. We're hearing from the, uh, from the irate consumer dissatisfaction with your service. In your ear, it, the, the, the agent is hearing in his ear, right. change your tone. I didn't know that. And that's really scary. That's sort of real-time AI influencing human behavior um, on this kind of feedback loop. So I'm not sure whether there are evidentiary uh, challenges that are absolute in this context or whether it, this is a fixable issue in terms of um, bringing 